I want to share a few things with you this morning from my heart. Um, I purposely did something today that I don't normally do. As I've gotten older, my memory is not as good as it used to be, and I'm sure that some of you understand how that is, especially if you're as old or older than me. You already know that our memory isn't as good. Sometimes I'll jot things down to try to help me to remember. But I felt compelled today by the Lord to lean a little more on the Lord to just pour into me as I spoke to the church because there was something on my heart and I wanted to talk to the church more from the perspective of a father. Uh, my kids, I've joked around about this. You've probably heard me say this. This this will tell you that I came from the time when I was watching Andy Griffith, you know. But my kids called it the Andy Griffith talk. When they got in trouble, and I sat on the edge of the bed. You guys remember that? Whenever Andy would sit on the corner of the bed and get the little talk and talk to you like a father. And I'd kind of like to do that this morning. I may not preach the same way that as I normally would, uh, but I did want to share a few things with you from that perspective because I feel like um, we as a people should do our best to have a better understanding of God's love. I think that some people, because their lack of it or inability to understand God's love, that through the trials of life that they have forfeited their love for God. They have turned their back or they said, you know, I don't want to do this. And then they make up a host of excuses why they don't serve the Lord. I just believe if you have a better understanding of the love of God, when trials come, when hardships come, when there are things in your life that seem unfair, that you'll continue to love God because you have a better understanding of His love. Hopefully that will make more sense by the time that I'm done. But if you have your Bible this morning, I'd like for you to do me a favor, and and, uh, I want you to go over to Romans chapter number 2, and we're going to be starting in verse number 11. I'm not going to ask you to stand this morning because I'd like to read something first before I read that to you. Um, I'd come across something this morning from a dear friend of mine, and To me, there are sometimes that people say things that maybe put it in words that are easy for others to relate to, and I kind of felt I felt like this was relatable to the fathers that are here and many other fathers. So while you're getting there, once you're there, just look this way. I know everyone's you know I got your attention because I did want to read something. This is a dear friend of mine, brother David Lamb has been. Uh, ministering for many years. We've known him for many years. He's pastored for several years, and he's preached revivals even in this church. Um, And I have a lot of respect for him as a man of God. But he wrote something on his social media platform that I wanted to read to you before we read our text, because I, like I said, I think there are some fathers that can relate to this. I will tell you, as I often try to pre-qualify on holidays like this, that I cannot speak for every father across the world. There are some pretty sorry fathers. There are some pretty good fathers. There are some who are okay fathers. But irregardless, I cannot cover every aspect of every father, so we're just going to try our best to talk about the right aspects of a good father this morning. But this is what he wrote, and I wanted to read it to you. It says, what, what fathers want for, for, for Father's Day, my wife always asks me what I want for Father's Day. Any of you ladies ever do that? What do you want, babe? She, she loves getting and giving thoughtful, not expensive gifts. It's just one of her love languages. Unfortunately, I don't care much about gifts, so it's sometimes difficult for her to know what to buy me. I'm sure that there are other wives who understand her plight. I'm trying to learn how to translate her love language because she really does throw her heart into it. I know I should have mastered this after 25 years, but I do not. Knowing she was going to ask me what I wanted for Father's Day, I have done a lot of thinking on it over the last past couple of weeks. And I've come to the conclusion that all, almost all fathers, what all fathers want for Father's Day and pretty much every day, is to feel respected 
and desired by their wives and to be, feel respected and appreciated by their children. That's it. Typically, fathers know they are respected and appreciated, but they don't hear it very often. If you want to make tomorrow or today, Father's Day, special for your father or your husband, do this. Sincerely tell them that you see, respect, and appreciate them for all they do. Let them know that you are aware of what they have sacrificed for you. This can be done in about 30 seconds, and it won't cost you a dime. They will probably brush you off telling you that they already know that. They probably won't cry and make a big deal out of it, but trust me when I say it will make their day possibly their year. If you can't do that, you can always fall back on buying them a gun, a boat, a guitar. I mean, that'll suffice until you can. Happy Father's Day, brothers. I love you and have have a heart for you and pray for you, so on and so forth. Stay blessed. How many of you fathers can say, I, I concur with that? I agree with that. The truth is, is that We may think that gifts and all of that sort of thing is where it's at, and truly gifts, the sacrifice in buying a gift can speak volumes in itself. But how many of you will agree, whether it's Mother's Day or Father's Day, just showing that you love somebody and showing the respect goes a real long way. It goes a real long way. I want to read you what the Bible said here in Romans chapter number 2 and verse 11 beginning. If you have it, say amen. For there is no respect of persons with God. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many have sinned without the law or without law shall also perish without law. And as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. The key thing I want you to remember in all that we've just read is there's no respect to persons with God. There is no respect of persons with God. This is going to be a little different Father's Day message than I've probably ever preached or taught, talked about before. But I believe it's a profound subject. I want to talk to you this morning on the impartial Father. Will you raise your hand this morning? Let's pray and ask God to have his way. Lord, this morning we're thankful for your word once again to stand before your holy presence in this place today to share exactly what you've put on my heart with this people. Lord, I've purposely come without a host of notes today relying completely on you. I need you to pour into me so that I can pour into these people. I'm asking you, God, to help me to pour out. Let the things that I say bring encouragement. Let them challenge us, God, to a higher place. And God, while we honor you as the great father of the whole entire universe, we also take time this morning to honor the fact that you have created fathers for a distinct purpose within the family unit, the structure that you have created yourself. I believe, God, that it is a earthly structure but also a divine structure made by God. I'm asking you, God, to help us to have stronger fathers, stronger homes. God, I believe in doing so will make a greater impact in our world, in our community, and more than anything, in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationships with our kids. I'm praying, God, today you'll help me to speak exactly what you want me to say, nothing more and nothing less. And I ask this through the name of Jesus, and everyone can say amen. When you were a child, if you grew up with any type of siblings, anybody had brothers or sister growing up, was there ever a time as a child that you ever thought to yourself that your parents were partial to your brother or to your sister? Did you ever think to yourself, well, they're doing something for me They didn't do for so-and-so, they're doing this, and -and so-and-so got this, and I didn't get that. You ever thought that? 
Now, I will tell you this morning that there are times that people can be partial. I'm not telling you that's an impossibility. But as a child, you don't fully understand life, and so you see life through a child's lens. But how many of you that have had kids, that have grown up, you understand things a little different now than you did back then? You see, as a child, I looked at that situation, and I always thought, well, the reason why that it is this way, I had convinced myself, well, my parents, my mom loves my brother more than she loves me. My mom loves my sister more than she loves me. But as I get older and I grow through life, I begin to understand some things that I did not understand at that time. One of the greatest things that I understood is about impartiality. And what do you mean by that? Well, when I think about my children now as they're grown, I still call them my children, but they're grown adults, and sometimes they remind me. They say, Dad, I'm not a little kid anymore. Dad, I'm a man. I'm a grown man, or I'm a grown woman now. And if you have kids and you've raised your own kids, you most all of you know that we even though we acknowledge they're adults, they seem to always be viewed through our eyes as our children. And we love them that way. And they will probably feel the same way when they get our age. But what I have to remind us as fathers and parents is is that people often view things through their own lens of perception. If they're 18 years old and they've never raised children, I cannot expect them to understand with wisdom, the things that I have come to understand myself, because they are looking at life through that lens of that age, through their experiences. So sometimes I give them a little bit of leadway, even when it's frustrating. But I love all of my children greatly. And I think to myself, when I read this particular verse in the Bible, that it's like those verses in the Bible that you think to yourself, I don't believe God's Word contradicts itself. But most of you that are here and you're honest, there have been times maybe that you read the Bible and maybe you raised your eyebrows. That's a little different. I don't know how I will process that because, I mean, the Bible says that God's no respecter of persons, but how is that possible When my next door neighbor, it seemed like everything they touch turns to gold, and here I am, I seem to be suffering every time you turn around. I'm always sick. I got problems in my life. How do we look at a verse like this and come away and understand the love of God when God says in one place that Israel is the apple of God's eye? How do we look at the Bible and we see that in one portion that a woman is caught in the very act of adultery And Jesus is kind enough to dismiss this woman's sin in front of everyone and says that he that has the first sin cast the first stone. But then you read in another portion where that you see Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Ghost and he drops them dead just like that. Why is it that in one portion of the Bible you see one nation spared while another nation may be wiped completely out? Well, you know, I cannot answer every question, but as I began to pray and meditate on these things, I felt like that it was imperative for us as a people to address what some may call the elephant in the room, because we all may have faith, but to say that we understand everything about the Bible might be a misleading statement. There are some things that we read and we say, well, I don't quite understand that, But I love God, and I know God's Word doesn't contradict itself. So this morning, with the Lord's help, I would like to try to help us to have a better understanding of the love of God, to show you that when God's Word says that He is no respect of persons, with people, God is no respect of you versus another man. And when you think about Israel being the apple of God's eye, Is God still not partial? No, he's not. And I'm going to show you why I say that this morning. You see, as a parent, I've begun to understand as time and life has, the process of time has gone along. 
There are certain needs. Somebody say that with me, needs. There are certain seasons. Can you say that? Seasons. And say this with me, circumstances. Circumstances. Seasons, needs, and circumstances that will cause a parent, a father, a mother to react in a specific way. Let me give you an example of what I mean. And the reason that I say this is because the God that we serve, he does not see a momentary or momentary seasonal problem. His love is not based on a seasonal issue. Our God is an overall God. He loves us from the time we're born. Throughout all eternity, he loves us. And if you don't see the whole picture and all you're seeing is a season, you will not understand the love of God. Now let me show you what I mean. In my time of being a father, there's been times that I may have a child that cannot get to work unless they have a car. And maybe I've had a good paycheck come in recently. Maybe I've got a little extra money. And you know what I would do? I'm trying to find a way to help them. That car might, I might put down $2,500 to try to help them get a car. Well, I've got two other kids. So does that mean that if I don't give them $2,500 that I don't love them? No. Because my love is not based on a situation. My love's not based on a specific need. My love is not based on a particular circumstance. Because the truth is, there will be times of my kid's life that one kid doesn't need a car. So it'd be kind of stupid for me to buy every one of my kids a car because one has a need. So the way that love works when you're a parent, and if I'm wrong, you can cut me off at any point. But you see the need that they have in their life. And when you're a good parent, you minister to the situation. You minister to the need according to the need. So if that child calls you and says, Mom, my electric's going to be cut off. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so you drop 700 and something dollars after you find out that it's not just past due. It's like about to be cut off because it's three months past due and you got three months to pay. Come on, parents, and help me out. So at this point, so you give, you know, 700 and whatever dollars. Maybe a couple weeks go by and they're out of food. You help them with food. What I'm trying to help you to understand, each and every situation may not be $2,500 for a car for all three kids, but in different situations and different needs, love will cause you to minister to the situation and to the need. So here's the reason that I bring this up to you. Because our God loves us not based on some particular thing that we're going through, some problem in our life. What if you were to look at God and say, God, you know, I'm, I've been renting for the last three years. I sure would like to have a house. Why did you bless them with the house and you didn't bless me with the house? Maybe God could say, because I blessed you with a child when you begged me for a child and they don't have one. Maybe it's because God said, I've been doing other things that you never even to acknowledge that I have done for you. Because at day's end, if we were to sit down and tally up everything that God has done for us, the list would be awful long. Someone say amen. So it would be easy for me to look at God and say, well, Lord, you must not love me the same way that you love somebody else. But I want you to understand God's love remains the same. Something that the Lord began to show me as I prayed and sought the Lord about this. Some of you will identify and you'll know exactly what I mean. But how many of you understand that love is easy when it is reciprocated back to you? You can say this about an animal. You can say it about a child. But how many ever had a particular child? Maybe it's a niece or a nephew. You don't know the reason why, but they just take to you. They want to sit in your lap. They want, to, they want to wrap their arms around you. They want to love you. How many of you know that makes love a lot easier? But you got some other kid. Now, I don't want Papa. I don't want him. I don't want Aunt so-and-so. And you're like, okay, then. Go on somewhere, snot-nosed. You know what I'm saying? Huh? 
I'm being silly. What I'm telling you is it makes it so much easier to love the people who reciprocate love back to you. Why is that important? Because I have watched children in homes, and if you're a child or you're a family member, you will, this is important for you to understand. It makes it so much easier to be a great father when the family doesn't make it hard on you to be a great father. If you want to be loved like all of your other siblings, if you want to be treated good, reciprocate love. Because what I have found is that there is a special connection whenever love is reciprocated. Do you understand what I mean? Is there any parent that can vouch for what I'm telling you? You've already raised your children and you can say, he's right. Have you ever had a situation where that you look at your children and you love them the same whether they believe it or not, but you can have a stronger connection with one because they reciprocate love to you more? Am I right, anybody? Any of you parents that know exactly what I'm saying? There are times that it is easier to have a relationship with a child, not because you favor that child, but because the child reciprocates the love. Be very cautious and careful not to ever get it in your mind. I know that there are people that are partial. I know that that is a possibility. But you can also train your own mind to believe that everyone's against you. My, lo- my father does not love me. Let me tell you, your father can love you more than you'll ever know. But there are situations that can affect the things we do as fathers. Let me give you an example this morning. If you have a child that has special needs, that particular child may often get more attention, more whatever they need because they are in a situation of need. But another child that doesn't have that same need, it does not change your love as a parent, but as a parent you're trying to minister to the need. As we look at God the Father, it's important that you understand that love Because one of the things that you'd be surprised as a pastor, I've heard more times than you can ever amount amount to measure up. God, why have you blessed so many other people? I try to be good, and it seems I struggle so much. I've heard people use that analogy so often because it doesn't seem fair. You ever felt like something in life wasn't fair? And you know what that will make you feel like? God don't love me. I'm here to tell you that God does love you. There are some of you that are parents that understand there are some situations where that you've got $500 in your wallet and your child says, I need $500, but you ain't letting go of that $500 because you know that if you just always give, 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 they will never learn how to earn, earn, earn. Do you know that there are situations with God and God's love Dad, he's not meant to be a sugar daddy. Say amen. God loves you enough to allow you to have times of your life to struggle. Because let me tell you, I can give my children my last name. Brother Coon, I can give them tools out of my toolbox. They love pocket knives. I could give them my entire pocket knife collection. There's one thing I can't give my kids that made me the man I am today, and that's my struggles. I've had to tell my children that as a father, my struggles made me, with God's grace and the struggles I've been, they've made me the man I am today. And if I pave the road in front of you and it's always easy, you'll never be a man. But the struggles will make you stronger. There are times that I've had to stand back when I wanted to act, when I wanted to react. Do you know there are times as a parent that I have prayed, God, help my child. But I found myself guilty that when God had them going through the wilderness, like the children of Israel did when they came out of Egypt, that what I was doing was I was making the wilderness comfortable for them. They didn't want to come out of the wilderness because I made the wilderness too comfortable. Why would I want to go to Canaan when I can just camp out here and let mom and dad be the one to take care of life? Say amen. What I'm trying to show you this morning is that God's not purposely dealing out 
a, a, a bad hand to people. Life is what it is. If you take a top and you spin it and let it go on a table, this time it's going to cut to the left, to the right, form behind, and it might even fall off the table. Next time you spin the top, it's going to go somewhere completely different. Life is just like that. God is not orchestrating things in such a way to make your life miserable. God loves you enough that in times of need that God will minister to your need. But God does not love you any more or any less than anybody else. There is a reason behind the things that God does. He sees you in your need. He knows what's best for you. And the big picture is, is that God looks at the situation and he understands that just like it is with me as a father, I might have times that I look around and say, well, son, your starter went out and it's gonna cost $280. So I fix his starter. Well, if my daughter speaks up and says, but you didn't buy me a starter. No, I didn't, but I paid your rent last month, so come on now. Come on, somebody, and say amen. What I'm telling you is, uh, is that love must be reciprocated, and we've got to get out of the place that we look at God like somehow or another he's this Santa Claus with a backpack on his back to just give, 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 give. I want you to understand God gives good gifts. He's a great heavenly father. But as a people, we're not meant to be spoiled brats. There are times of our life that we have to understand that it rains on the just and the unjust alike. If you want things in life, get out there, work hard, and believe for faith and grace in God that God will bless you, say ma'am, and stop forgetting all that God has already done for you. You're not serving an impartial God. I say this this morning because people will subliminally never say a word but struggle in their mind about why is other people blessed. Here I am living in this old rusty mobile home. Cars sometimes have an issue, got bald tire, need tires. You know what happens to people like that? They look around them and they become jealous of what other people have and what they're doing and what God's blessing them with. Why can't we celebrate with people? Why can't we turn that back on the devil and just celebrate with people? Say, man, you got a new car? Well, praise the Lord, bless you. Because it might be their season right now. It might have been your season last season. Come on now. But if you're not mindful, you'll forget everything God's ever done for you. Do you know one of the biggest mistakes that God's people made? They murmured and they complained about everything that God had done for them. God came along later on and he said, have you forgot that I fed you with manna? I made sure that you had a cloud by day and a fire by night. I fed you, I gave you water out of a rock. I kept you alive in a place that nobody else could stay alive. I made sure that you had it. And you might not have had a great abundance, but I took care of you. Look at where you are. Quit forgetting everything God's blessed you with because you and I have got a great heavenly father and he loves his people more than you'll ever know. If you'll start counting up your blessings one by one, you'll start realizing, well, God brought me out. I completely forgot about God bringing me through that season. I completely forgot when everybody was sick and I was well and I was able to work and pay my bills. I forgot that God made it possible that when my car was messed up that somehow I ended up with this that I got now. Thank God for the blessings that he's given me before. Honey, if you don't start praising God and if you don't start giving God thanks and appreciation for what he did yesterday, how I, God forbid that he cut off the faucet next season when you need it, say amen. Let God know I appreciate everything you've done. I started off and read to you a, a little thing that my brother, friend, Brother Lamb had wrote on his page. The respect, the appreciation. And all of us men here today agree. Yes, the greatest thing you could ever do for me. I don't need lots of gifts. I love rod and reels and I love tools and things like that. But at this age of my life, I've got almost everything I could want. You know what I want more than anything? I want to know that I'm appreciated for the things I do sacrifice. For the times that I need to cut my own grass and I'm cutting yours. For the times that I'm working on stuff late at night. Come on, that respect goes a long ways. If it goes the same for us, just imagine how God feels. 
to know that we appreciate even the smallest thing. You Because for some people, it's just never enough. No matter what you do for it, it's never enough. You could give them everything but one thing, and it's just never enough. I remember a day, one of the most hurtful things that I ever had to happen to me. I was hurting in my body. I was having some issues in my back. And I needed to get a couch out of my house. I had no help. And yet I had one of my family members sitting in a car, facing my direction, watching me wrestle with the couch, trying to put it in the back of a truck by myself. Well, if you know me, I'm just the type of person. I'm not begging anybody for anything. If you don't love me enough to help me, I'm not begging you to do anything. By God's grace and a whole lot of muscle, I picked that couch up and I stuck that booger right in the back of the truck. One of the heaviest couches you ever pick up. But it shouldn't have been that way. Is it like that just to make no sense that some of the people that you have been over backwards for will look at you and land as if it's never enough? Am I right? Folks, let me tell you. One of the best things that you can do in a family unit, some of you that are mothers, wives, children, hear me out. If you're not careful, you can make it difficult for a father to be a good father. Do you know what happens to some people when it's never enough, when it's never good enough, when fathers are always undermined, they have no authority in the home? I'm not talking about abusive physically or verbally abusive men, but when your authority's always undermined and nothing is ever good enough, do you know what fathers generally do? They just quit. They quit trying. Well, then, son, well, he's a sorry dad. Do you know what you can do as a child or as a wife? Create an environment that makes it a whole lot easier for him to be a good man. Treat him like a good man. Well, you might say, well, pastor, what about wives? This is not Mother's Day. Any of you that know me, I am a staunch advocate for ladies. Sometimes probably even more than men. But when you're a man and you speak on a man's behalf, sometimes it don't go over very well because people think you're trying to be a male chauvinist. That ain't what I'm doing, honey. I'm just telling you that that, that knife cuts both ways. Say amen, somebody. The same way that a wife deserves respect, I've said it before in this pulpit, no wife deserves to be no uh, doormat for their husband. Come on and say amen. But at the same token, that man deserves to have respect. That man deserves to have the ability to feel like he is the head of the house. I've known some ladies that don't give them the respect for that, so they quit trying. Let me tell you something, folks. When it comes to our Heavenly Father, He deserves the great respect of His people for what He has done. Listen, as I got ready today and I I prepared for this service, many things were running through my mind. And because I'm in ministry, ministry crossed my mind. There have been times at Sister Marissa that I've looked around and I've said, well, I guess I'm not a very good pastor because if I was, maybe I'd be running 10,000 people in a congregation. But as I got ready today, something crossed my mind because sometimes we think of life from a very selfish perspective. What I didn't get, what I don't get, what my kids didn't get, what my wife didn't get, what our church didn't get. We can look at things very selfishly. But this crossed my mind. What if God didn't put you in a church pastoring 10,000 people because you'd have probably been like the ones that are pastoring that ready to commit suicide? Maybe God knew that there were problems that you wouldn't be able to handle. And because of his love, he allowed you to be in that situation. I liken that this morning, and I'm going to use my son. He's here But uh, don't think, he drives a lot better now. Still don't drive the best, but I still love him. 
But whenever I've shared this before, whenever I was trying to teach Devin how to drive, I said, no, son, you are not ready to drive. No, I love you. And I don't say this in any slight against him. I love my son more than you'll ever know. But when my son told me, he said, well, Dad, you know, Caleb's already driving, and so-and-so's already driving. I need to, you know, I, how come I can't drive? I said, you ain't Caleb. And you, Caleb ain't my son. And you're not ready. As far as a father, I did not feel like that I was going to put my son in harm's way that he could get out there on the road and get killed because I want you to, well, you know, Caleb's driving. Well, that's fantastic. So go get in the car and go get out there and get killed. I didn't want to do that. You see, God in, very, in a very similar way, God understands what you are capable of as a person. And God understands that there are circumstances that if he allows you to get into, you might self-destruct. So while you sit back and complain because you say, well, God, you must not love me as much as somebody else. How is this possible? You have to take into account that all that God has done in your life, the mercy that God showed you. Brother Coon, you might say, well, God, you know, look at here, I'm living over here in Bassfield Park. I thought I'd be living in a, a before car garage, and I, I, I thought by now I'd have the biggest boat in town, and we'd already be sitting on about $200,000 in retirement. But God might say, son, I did something for you that would blow your mind. You remember that time you were sitting in jail? You could be in prison right now. And Brother Coon's ears perk up. He said, you know what, God? I believe I'll stay right here where I'm at in Bassfield Park over a little six-by-eight cell in prison because of some crazy stuff. Come on now. So I might not have everything, but I got a lot. Come on. I, what I'm telling you is, is that sometimes we can become belly acres and groaners and gripers about everything going on in life. But in this Father's Day, I want you to know you got, a, you got an awesome father. You got one that loves you more than you'll ever know. And you say, well, God, I don't understand certain seasons like this. But life is going to happen to everybody. But if you wait, there'll come a time when that wheel spins around and God said, hey, I see you're in need and God ministers to that very need that you have. But when God does that, don't you forget who God is. Don't you forget what God's ever done for you. Because if you keep tallying everything up, you'll find out that God's been better to you than you could ever realize you say well God I don't understand why you know I got this old car right here let me tell you you better be thankful because that car might be the only thing making sure you got a paycheck every week getting you to work and getting you back home you say but God I've been struggling in this area but God said look I blessed you back then did you forget about that let's balance the scale all out because God said my love is not conditional my love is not situational my my love is not circumstantial. I don't just love you when I bless you. you. Did you hear me? I said, God don't just love you when he blesses you. God don't just love you when he does for you. That is a byproduct of God's love that already exists. If God never done another thing for you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on, somebody. If I'm not living in the Ritz or the Hilton, if I'm not eating caviar and steak every day, for God so loved the world that when this old dirty death doom body of mine goes to the grave, I'm going to wake up on the other side on streets of gold. Amen. Gates of pearl. Walls of... Come on now, somebody. I'm going to wake up in a different place place, a place of joy and bliss. Why am I complaining now? Say amen, somebody. Amen. You can, oh, come on now. I'm just telling you that if we don't start becoming a people of gratitude and have the right attitude, we're going to be no more or no different than those in the wilderness who miss Canaan because of their murmuring and their complaining. What kind of God we've got. What kind of God did we have? Well, Lord, I, I had to settle for the six-cylinder Mustang. I always wanted the eight. I always wanted the Boss GT. I was hoping for the Shelby. Hey, man, I wanted the Cobra Mustang. Some of y'all are like, what in the world is he talking about? Some of you know. Huh? I was hoping for the, I was ho hoping for the biggest size, number three. Huh? But I could only afford the medium drink and the medium fry. 
But God said, did you forget that last week you ate out over there at uh, the crab house, you know what I'm saying? You forgot about that? So if you're eating french fries and number two medium size this week, don't forget that I fed you real good last week. Come on now. Because if you're not careful, you'll be looking over the fence at the neighbor's house where they just got a new car. God, I've been serving you all these years, been paying my tithes, and I love you so good. Why am I still driving this 200,000 mile uh, car? God may look at you and say, but have you forgot that I blessed you in other ways? Oh, my Lord, help me. Amen. I'm just trying to help marry this idea together that as fathers, earthly fathers, that there are times that we do things for our children not out of preference, not out of partiality, but because of situation, because of circumstance or need, and you minister to that. But that does not dictate our love. If you're not careful... You have one child, they'll say, Sister Nora or Mama, I don't understand why you baked me a nut bread cake and you didn't, you, you didn't bake them or so-and-so a nutty bread cake. Huh? Yeah, that might be true. They also asked me for it. That's one of their favorite things. But you also forgot that last month I made this for you. Sometimes we can be so spoiled. So jealous. The wrong spirit. Oh, I'm glad y'all are agreeing with me because you know what? We've all been guilty. I have belly ached a handful of times at least. And I said, oh God, I don't understand why. I remember one time I was driving through this old neighborhood, man. I'm telling you, everybody got fountains in the front, big old driveways, circle driveways, and big old pretty houses. And I mean, they had it all going on. Big lanai in the backyard. I mean, they looked like, you know, they were living the high life, like Morgan and Morgan kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking at that driving through the neighborhood and I started getting tears in my eyes thinking to myself that I love my family so good. Why have I not been able to give that to my family? Thinking to myself, here I've been sacrificing, pastoring, I've been doing all this and then I have to get a wake-up call that God's able to say, I've kept you whenever you might not have been able to be kept any other way. Look at all the other ways that I've blessed you because at the day, at day's end, our blessings are not just material real mess, folk. Come on now. Love is bigger than a thing. Love's bigger than a PlayStation. Love's bigger than a 50-inch television. Love's bigger than a car. Love's bigger than a truck. Love's bigger than all that. Love is so much bigger than stuff. You can, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world, lose his own soul? Because of that relationship that you have with God, Stuff is not where it's at. Got so much stuff, we got to get storage units to put it all in. But God says, look, my love's so much bigger than that. When you die, you can't put all that stuff in the casket with you. And if you do, you ain't taking it with you when you go. Oh, God, help us this morning. I've come this morning to remind us as a people, he is not an impartial, or a partial, should I say, He's not a partial father. He loves you. I was thinking about someone that I know very well. They were one of the healthiest people I ever met in my whole life. And it was only until they got up in their age that they started having physical problems. And I watched them. They've had times of suffering. And they might not have very many more years left. Well, they could look at God and say, God, why is me? But if you take the whole picture, instead of a season, God is able to say, I have loved you. I kept you so healthy all those years. You worked a job. You kept the food on the table. Honey, listen to me. Just hang on a little while. Won't be much longer. You'll be hearing that cry. Come on up a little higher. 
that cry at midnight. And brother Eric, you might be in the middle, and God forbid you could be in the middle of an epidemic or a diabetic situation, and God say the lights are going out, come on up higher. You might be laying in the bed, have a heart attack in the middle of the night. God may say, now's your moment. You might just die from an accident in the car somewhere. You don't never know, but at day's end, there's one thing I can tell you, that God's been good to you. He's blessed you. And those of you that got salvation paid in full, the greatest price for humanity was paid on the cross and you've got eternity in view. Man, quit looking at what you ain't got right now. Start looking at what you got over there. Huh? You're the richest man in the room. You know why? Because you've got eternity in view. Oh, come on now. Stand to your feet, if you will, across the house. I told you this morning that this might be a little different Father's Day message than I've ever preached, but I've just tried to follow the leading of the Spirit today to help you to understand that if you are not careful... You'll be sitting around looking across the fence at your neighbors, looking in the mirror at you, what you're going through, what you're dealing with, how come, why is me? And then there's another aspect of that that we often forget about. Sister Miranda's coming to the piano this morning. Sometimes the why me stuff, we don't like to say this, but sometimes it's because of our own choices. When God said, I didn't tell you to marry that guy. Huh? I didn't tell you to marry him. You up here blaming me about what you ain't got, how he don't want to work, all that kind of stuff. I didn't tell you to, but I didn't tell you to marry him. You had to have him. He was fine. He had a lot of pictures on Instagram and everything. He had the coolest shoes you ever seen. You thought his cologne smelled good. You had to have him. You brought him home. Sometimes we don't want, we don't want to accept the fact that our choices are why we are where we are in situations. When God said, I didn't tell you to quit that job. God said, I didn't tell you to pursue that particular career. Matter of fact, you never prayed and asked me what you should do. Our selfish ambitions and desires, oftentimes, we fail to realize just how good that our God has been to us. I can tell you one of the most hurtful things as a father, and I have to wonder how God must feel, is when you've done so much and it's never enough. Any of you fathers agree with me? Because there's some men in here today, like myself, who can testify to this. I'm going to tell you all up front, if you ever see me in flip-flops, don't look at my feet. I got ugly toes. Let me tell you why. Over 30 years, I've worn work boots, and my toes ain't the prettiest thing. But I did that to make sure my kids had food on the table and they had a roof over their head. I have worked, I've worked really hard, sometimes two and three jobs. When my kids was teenagers, they were poking fun, calling me old man and all this kind of stuff and they're making fun of my feet and everything. I say, you can laugh at my feet all you want to, but you better be thankful for them feet right there because them feet right there carried this big old boy around, made sure you could eat. I said, one of these days, you're going to be a man. You're going to be and maybe have your own kids, and you're going to have the ability to see that this old man right here, I made a lot of sacrifices to make sure you had something. There were times I got up and went to work. I didn't want to work. I remember one day when my son called me up, and he said, Dad, boy, this being a, being a, 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 a husband and a father stuff ain't as easy as you think whenever you're a kid. I said, I know, son. It's tough. But let's give a shout out to them fathers. The kind that will love, work, and show their love the best way they know how. And let me show you something. Sister Victoria was sharing with me the other day about her husband. She bragged on him with tears in her eyes. She said she got a good man. Right? So he's a hard worker. Said sometimes he just don't know when to quit. I've said this in the past, but I want you to hear me out because it's very important. Since it is Father's Day, please don't ever forget this. Everybody shows love differently. Okay? And hear me out. Without using names or different situations, I've always been more the romantic type with my wife. Not all husbands are like that. I'm more the type that 
buy my wife flowers or do some pretty thing or whatever, say some real smooth thing that sounds like, you know, I got it out of a book somewhere. But not all fathers or husbands are like that. And I've had times before that other people she knew would compare their husband to me. I said, well, my husband don't do like so and your husband. And one day I told my wife, I said, I wish they'd quit doing that. I said, because what they don't understand is that every husband is not exactly the same. You know where your flowers come from? Your flowers are when you're sitting down at the nail salon spending $50, $60 to get them gel and your nails because your husband been working late hours at night. He might not have bought you flowers, but he's making sure you still look pretty when you go in and get them nails done. That you can go in the store and buy you a little something making you look good. I'm just telling you something. Everybody has a different way of showing their love. And that man knows that if he goes out there and works good, he works hard, you can go to the store and you ain't got to stand at the checkout line counting quarters trying to find out if you got enough money to buy that shirt that you've seen on the rack. Because he shows you that he loves you when he gets up in the morning. And you say, well, I wish you were a little bit more romantic. I wish you would do. I, sometimes husbands wish their wives do things too. Y'all may not know that. But hey, we're in this for the long haul. And this is Father's Day. And I'm just trying to help us fathers and husbands out a little bit to understand. The day's in. Those sacrifices that we make. Whenever you can call your husband and say, baby, the car's making a funny noise. What? What's it doing? Well, the front tire, I don't know, it's just making a squealing noise. So your husband don't think in anything of it. And he goes out there, takes care of it, fixes it. Not all husbands are the same. Some don't have mechanical ability. I'm just using this as an example. You didn't have to take your car down to the car lot or down to the mechanic shop and pay $1,500 you got the whole thing done for $350 because your husband spent his whole Saturday underneath the car fixing it for us. So you didn't get flowers last week, but you got to drive to work. You got to drive to Ross. You got to go to McDonald's. Am I preaching right? I'm sorry for keeping you on your feet. Somebody say Happy Father's Day. Come on now. If there's good men in your life, you make sure that you let them know how much you love them. Because they may not be the most romantic Joe on the block. But let me tell you something. If they're taking good care of you, you thank God that you got somebody that loves you enough to make sure you got what you need. When you're able to go to the store and buy that baby some diapers, whenever you're able to go to the store and buy that baby an outfit, and you know he's doing his best to take care of that family, you make sure he knows it. And you make sure your kids know you got a good daddy. Huh? Let them kids know you got a good daddy. I'm giving you an opportunity here this morning to go before the Lord in prayer. I want, well, this is what I want to do. Maybe this doesn't apply to you because of your circumstances. Maybe you're in a situation that this won't apply to you, but maybe you are. And you say, I'm a wife, I'm a son, I'm a daughter. I have men that are in our life, whether it be an uncle or somebody. Help me to make it a lot easier for these people to be the kind of man that they need to be. Help me. And most of all, God help me stop living like a spoiled brat that when, when I go through a hard season that somehow or another God don't love me no more. Help me to count up those blessings, Lord. Would you bow your heads and begin to pray with me this morning? Father, this morning as we collectively come before heaven's throne, I'm asking you, God, to help us as a people that we consider and remember just how good that you have been to us. To know that even in times that it seems that you might be a partial God, that you're impartial, that you, your love stays and remains the same. Sometimes it may seem like our connection is weak. But most every time that's going to be because I have not reciprocated the love for you. God, help me to express and show my love and gratitude through my determination and my life of obedience to you. Lord, help me to reciprocate love. Lord, if there's a man, a husband, a, a father figure in my life, God, help me to show my appreciation my thanks because we're living in a world where a good man is getting harder and harder to find a good father is becoming harder to find this morning Lord we honor our fathers 
And most of all, we honor you, the role model for all fathers. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. With your family this week. Today.